The reason for sort of putting up a picture of the Tower of Blackton Church is quite simple, insofar as it was that that got me interested in the Somerset wool industry. Because when you think of it, back in 1470-ish, when that tower was built, 1470, and it's still there, we're talking about a 13, 14-storey building by modern standards. The stone was brought from Dundry. Um, it's beautifully built, as you will all no doubt spotted. The stones fit beautifully together. It's a real work of art. It's the sixth highest um, parish church tower in Somerset and would have cost a bomb at the time. Even with labour rates as there were then, it would have cost a lot of money. And so the question came to me, well, where did the money come from? Who paid for it? And it'll come as no surprise to you, of course, there's no paperwork at all on pretty well any of the Somerset churches and their towers. Um, so nobody really knows, but I would bet a Ferrari to a farthing that a great chunk of it came from the wool industry. It's almost impossible for that sort of time to overemphasize just how important it was. Um, it was the source of wealth in the country, and a lot of it ultimately flowed to the church. The people um, at the time thought they would be saving their souls, saving time in purgatory by giving money to the church. And so it was a time when there was money available and people were very pleased to give it. A couple of quotes there. Um, again, essentially emphasising how important people at the time thought the wool industry was to the country. Give you a bit of time to read them, rather than me read them out. That again, what I would really emphasise is it's impossible for certain periods during our history to overemphasise just how important the raw industry was to Somerset and to the country generally. And the Somerset wool industry, it went through broadly, very broadly, four phases. That we started off very much producing wool. There were a lot of sheep. Um, we were producing wool. And that wool in bales was exported by and large to Europe. It went to Europe rather than being processed in this country by and large. Um, although having said that, of course, there was always domestic knitting, always a domestic industry for um, people to make their own clothes. But in terms of commercial industry, most of the wool went to the continent. We then started to send partly produced cloth to the continent. So it was woven, but then not finished. So it wasn't um, a finished garment, anything like a finished uh, roll of cloth as you would know it, but it was finished off on the continent. Then we started refining it, filling it, uh, filling it, and finish it off ourselves. And ultimately, there was an almost total ban on wool exports. So again, it was processed almost entirely in the county, in the, the country. And then round about, let's say, the early 1400s, the industry went into a fairly steep decline locally. Um, and I will go into details as to why that actually happened. Two other fairly basic points I'd like to make at this stage, which might make the rest of the talk make more sense. Um, the first of all is when we're talking about wool and cloth, there were and are a lot of different varieties, a lot of different um, weights, ways of weaving it, ways of presenting it. Um, all of them have got sort of technical terms, most of which I probably don't know. So please don't ask too many questions about it. But um, Again, I'm generalizing across the piece that there was a lot of variation. And the other thing which is blindingly obvious as soon as you say it, but actually struck me a bit like a thunderbolt, is I think today we think of wool as being jumpers, things like that. 
back in the day, wool was very much outerwear as well. It wasn't just jumpers. It was overcoats. It was stuff that was supposed to be waterproof as much as they could make wool waterproof. And again, when we talk about some of the processes, it's very much to try and make the wool as waterproof as possible um, within the context of the uh, technology of the time. So I'm going to kick off um, round about the Doomsday Book, um, the Normans, 1086. There was a wool industry in Somerset decades, centuries before that. It was probably almost certainly a Roman wool industry. Um, but in terms of factual information, and the Doomsday Book is our, really our first source. And you can see from that, amongst all the other information, that there were three cattle, 13 pigs, 50 sheep and 60 goats in the parish at the time. Um, so the sheep at that stage massively outweighed the, the, the domestic animals like cattle and pigs. Over England as a whole, um, it is estimated that there may well have been about 8 million sheep at a time when the human population of the country was something like 2 million. Um, now, I have to be fairly vague on that insofar as although the Doomsday Book in Somerset did count sheep, it wasn't they weren't counted in many other counties. So it's a very incomplete picture. So who owned those sheep? Um, if we look at Charterhouse just as an example, <laughs> Charterhouse, um, Limestone Upland, very much sheep country. Um, and as you all will know, hopefully, there was never an actual monastery at Charterhouse, but it was land owned by the Carthusian monks, those at Whittam Abbey. There was um, a number of lay um, people from the Carthusians who lived and worked up there, and their main task was keeping sheep. They weren't enclosed, so forget all the stone walls and so on that you see up there today. Um, it was very much more like, um, say, the Lake District, um, much more open, and the sheep had their heft. And for those of you who don't know what that is, even today there are flocks of sheep that know their own territory. They know they can go so far up the hill and no further. And each generation teaches the lambs, the, the, the flocks, heft. And that almost certainly was the case um, up on Mendip at the time. We don't know what breeds there were. Um, they're very vague. And of course, nobody was selectively breeding at the time. It was very much left to nature um, what breeds um, lived and survived up there. But again, it's important to think it through as to what makes good wool. Uh, this is something I'll come a bit more on to later. But broadly speaking, the more the sheep exercise, wander on the hillside, forage for food on their own, the higher the quality of the wool by and large. Um, whereas if you herd sheep tightly together with a very high intensity, then they get fitter, fatter and larger but the quality of the wool by and large um, suffers as a result. On the same three, on the same theme, <coughs> excuse me, one of the biggest landowners in this part of the world, of course, was Glastonbury Abbey at the time, who had very large flocks of sheep throughout the area. And in that, they were very similar to many of the monasteries of the time. The monasteries were among the big big landowners. And it's worth saying that, that at this time, early medieval, most of the country was owned by very few people. So just as an example, at the time of the Doomsday Book, Somerset, there are only 47 landowners recorded. So all of Somerset was owned by 47 retainers of William the Conqueror. And I would emphasize that sheep were very valuable. Sheep were so valuable that you did not usually, certainly in their prime, kill them for mutton. The value of the sheep was in the wool, not in the meat. 
there were other things. It produced the meat, obviously, when it was beyond um, beyond useful age for, for, for the wool. And that was probably six, seven years old, typically, but it did vary. Milk. I mean, the ewes were milked. And they, it was at the time it was reckoned that five ewes produce as much milk as one cow. Cheese, one way of preserving the goodness of the milk. Um, and the dung, would you believe? The dung was highly valued at the time as a way of um, maintaining the fertility in the soil um, and providing a better crop yield, um, particularly on the lowlands where the crops were, were, uh, were more likely to be grown. Um, when the sheep were kept for milk, they would uh, the lambs, the new lambs of the season, would tend to be weaned about May the 1st, and the ewes were then milked through to about August the 1st. Um, so that was a sort of time frame for the milk. But the important thing was wool cloth. And I'm afraid to make sense of what goes on a bit later on. I'm going to have to very briefly take you through the processes um, to produce wool cloth. And what is interesting is if you went around a wool processing plant today, let's call it rather than a textile mill, essentially the same processes would be taking place today, perhaps in a very different manner, perhaps um, obviously a much more industrial scale, but you can identify each of those processes. So obviously it starts with the actual shearing of the wool off the sheep. Um, there's actually a, a sheep down in the field below the church today, I notice. God knows how it happened, but certainly, literally half the sheep, the left-hand side is bare, and the right-hand side has still got all of its fleece on it. So uh, it, it's quite extraordinary, but um, there it is. They're normally sheared. Um, it, these days, if nothing else, for the uh, comfort of and the health of the sheep, even though the wool isn't necessarily very valuable. The fleece then has to be sorted because you get various grades of wool off the one animal. So, for example, the wool off the legs and the underbelly is usually of a much coarser quality than elsewhere on the body. And so you, before it goes to any th further processing, somebody sorts out the, the good stuff from the less good. Scouring. The wool as it comes off the sheep, it's got briars on it, it's got um, grease, it's got it's dirty, and the scouring is essentially a cleaning process um, to get the wool into a usable state. It's then combed, and the idea behind that is to get the strands of wool essentially in parallel, all in the same direction, rather than all higgledy-piggledy. Then you spin it to make it into a thread. Then you can weave it you know, to make your fabric. Um, and then finally, there's the finishing, um, which involves usually um, wetting it again and shrinking it to make it a tighter weave and dyeing, if dyeing indeed is going to take place. So I'm going to go through those processes briefly um, in turn. Shearing. The shear, shears on the right, on the, on the picture there, basically that design stayed unchanged from Roman times right through to pretty well the start of industrial shearing machines today. Quite extraordinary. In terms of technology, it's perhaps the most longest lasting I, I can think of anyway. And in the picture, you can see um, people out in the field actually using a shear, a pair of shears like that to actually um, do the job. In medieval times, it was reckoned that you sheared the sheep on or about June the 1st. And in areas like ours, that was normally followed by a real, real party, a real festival uh, to celebrate it being completed. So it was an important part of the, the, the calendar. In terms of combing the wool to actually get it um, into a sort of parallel set of strands. Um, 
during the medieval period, they invented these combing, these combs. So again, basically they're very simple. They are wires set in a wooden frame, which you use to stroke the, the wool and to comb it pretty well as you would your own hair. Um, it also crucially removes any very short hairs, which aren't much use for the uh, later processes. And again, that's another picture of combing where you can see the, the strands of wool starting to be parallel. So that's what it starts to look like. Spinning. I suspect we all tend to think of spinning by a spinning wheel. But certainly at the start of the period I'm talking about, they hadn't yet been invented. So um, what you actually use, and the lady on the right is doing it, is you had a distaff, um, which is what she's got on her left, in her left hand over her shoulder. So she's got the wool wrapped around that and is feeding out with her hand the wool down across her body onto a spindle down on her right hand side down on the floor which again she's rotating so it's quite a skilled occupation um you know trying to coordinate it's a bit like sort of like patting your head and stroking your stomach at the same time it's uh, I, I wouldn't want to try it myself um but of course um it was very much seen as women's work as it has been pretty well throughout history and of course that's why unmarried girls even today women are called spinsters um, because they were the usually the ones who did the spinning um, right the way through history particularly the eldest daughters anyway people then got fairly grateful when the spinning wheel was invented um, the first ones and an early one is on the right there um, didn't have a treadle to actually make it uh, go round so you had to with one hand make it go round and again feed it with the uh, threads on the, on the other hand. Again, pretty skillful. Um, and again, on the left, there is a, a, a contemporary picture of um, women actually doing it. It then went to the loom. And at the start of this period, it was the vertical, vertical loom that was in use. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the detail of how a loom works, because it would take too, a, take too long. And B, I'm not sure I understand it myself. <laughs> but essentially, the idea is you've got um, threads going horizontally, threads going vertically, and you are integrating them in a zigzag pattern um, on, on the loom. And that's the warp and the weft, uh, they're called, um, being integrated. During this period, the technology changed to a horizontal loom, um, the key advantage of which was you could produce much larger pieces of cloth on a horizontal loom, much longer pieces, than you could on a vertical. Um, so for most of the period I'm talking about, the horizontal loom was the one that was in use. However, and it's quite a big however, the downside was that when um, textile looming was a cottage industry, it didn't have to take up a lot of space. That when people were in small cottages, um, then very often, um, the loom had to go into some sort of wooden lean-to or uh, outbuilding, um, obviously unheated, and um, um, otherwise it would just occupy all the living space. Scouring, removing the dirt, the impurities, and the excess grease. So you start off by wetting the, um, the wool in some sort of solution. Now, Historically, that was stale urine. That from Roman times onwards, urine was actually a valuable commodity. And at certain times, people were actually paid um, a penny a pot to take their urine uh, along to the weaves. And that's true. I'm not making it up, honest. Um, indeed, at one period, the, the urine from, <laughs> from the clergy, particularly bishops, was particularly highly prized and obviously having a sort of a holy aura to it. Um, later on, um, they used soap, um, some of which was made from lye. And of course, there's lye crossed just down the road from here. <coughs> um, or um, Fuller's Earth. And again, I'll come on to Fuller's Earth a bit later on. After that process, then the 
um, the wool was suspended in a fast flowing stream, which is a flowing stream. So again, here, I think you can imagine um, down the bottom where the lake is currently, you had the river um, and undoubtedly there would have been women down there again, as per that picture there. Um, there is a woman, women sort of feeding the um, material into the, the, the stream. There they are washing it and there they are hanging it out to dry again on the riverbank. So again, I think you can imagine it quite happily on the flat land as it was then by the river. A hive of activity. Pulling <laughs> is basically to shrink the cloth. But when it comes off the loom in those days, it was quite loose um, and needs to be shrunk and uh, tightened to actually make good material. And it worked by a mixture of friction and pressure. And so what you will find where there are records, most of the water mills, certainly in this area, but many others as well, at some stage may well have been used to full cloth rather than grind corn. And the principle is quite simple, that um, that shaft is attached to the water wheel, so it's going round. You've got these bits on a wheel there, catching those bits of wood, lifting those weights. And then when the wheel goes round, those weights are reduced, uh, released and drop down onto the cloth. Okay. Fairly simple, I hope. Everybody got the general gist? Um, I, I think it makes sense. And there on the right is a picture of it actually um, happening. So again, you've got these wooden bits um, sticking out from the shaft, lifting the weights and then pounding down on the cloth. So that replaced um, people actually having to tread the cloth as you would tread wine, say. Um, so quite a big development. And in fact, um, one, one author called it um, an industrial revolution of the 13th century, that um, it really was perhaps one of the first applications of um, water power to a technology. Um, and the water wheel, of course, can keep going much longer than human feet can. So that was a, 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 good, uh, a good selling point. And full cloth at the time would shrink something like a third of its length and a quarter of its width. That was the general intention. And that gave you a much firmer, um, much more waterproof cloth than the fairly loose weave you'd get off the, uh, um, the weaver. Um, just as a, an aside, really, um, Chaucer, you know, the... Um, uh, Canterbury Tales. Um, you, you may all remember the wife of Bath's tale. Um, she, as a person, actually lived just outside Bath and she was heavily involved in the cloth making industry. So uh, Chaucer was quite familiar with what was going on in our area at the time. To finish the cloth, um, if it was a good quality cloth, I and mean, this wouldn't always happen, then you would have a frame, it was called. Wouldn't, sorry, didn't work. Not gone. Why is it not gone? You pressed me. Thank you. Um, wooden frame with teasels attached to it. Um, and the idea was that you dragged that across the wet cloth um, and it would raise the nap, raise the texture, and then you would shear it. And that was obviously a very skilled job to make a nice even surface. And for good quality cloth, you could you'd do that several times. And the reason teasels were so highly prized for the job was that if they snagged on the cloth, it would be the teasel that broke rather than tearing the cloth. Um, and so I'll come on to a bit more later on, but teasels were used way even into the 20th century 
even highly mechanized mills up in Yorkshire um, for really high quality cloth were sometimes still using teasel for that one reason that um, if they snagged, it was the teasel that broke, not the cloth. Um, sometimes, again, for high quality cloth, after that process, it would go into a screw press and again press down to to, to, to make it more um, concentrated. And wool, um, you can't see it with the naked eye, <clears throat> but wool has tiny hooks on it. And by compressing it, you've got these hooks to combine with each other and which what gives you a much tighter um, fabric. So again, in, in the olden days, when you were, let's say, doing naval officers' uniforms um, that had to withstand the weather of Force 10 gale going around Cape Horn, then it was really quite important that the cloth was as waterproof as you possibly could make it. And so in that context, it was quite often more like what we might term as a, in terms of density and heaviness of felt rather than a, a, a nice cloth that we would recognize. Dyeing, and again, I'm gonna stop talking for a second here. They are the key ingredients of the various colored dyes that were used in the medieval period. Fair variety, I think you'll agree. A lot of those were imported, a lot of the raw materials, as you can imagine. Um, a lot of them came in to the port of Southampton and were then shipped up to Salisbury and Salisbury was, for our area, the big distribution focus that uh, the traders there sent the dye stuffs, uh, the ingredients for the dyes, rather, out from Salisbury. Um, not all the cloth was dyed, and some cloth, indeed, the, it was actually um, was dyed before the weaving rather than after it. Um, but... The cheaper cloth, I mean, these dye stuffs were expensive, as you can imagine, they were imported. So the um, poorer people very often would um, wear undyed wool. And paradoxically, <clears throat> at certain periods in history, it was the black wool or the coloured wool, the brown wool, that was actually valued more than the white because it meant you could um, have a coloured cloth from it without having to use dye. Um, whereas as soon as dyes became cheap, then you didn't want the brown uh, because it made dyeing that much more, more difficult. So uh, things do change. As I said, I think um, at times the cloth was hung up out in fields to dry off and to stretch. And that, of course, is where we get the term being on tenterhooks, that the tenterhooks are those things there which were used on wooden racks to hold the cloth, the edges of the cloth, as it was um, hung up to dry. And on the right, you've got a whole um, run of the sort of racks that we're talking about. Those are fairly modern uh, but by comparison, and therefore probably much more solidly built. But if you see old maps of most cities, most towns in the country, um, you can spot quite often the fields full of the um, those racks um, filled with cloth on tenterhooks. Um, I mean, London, for example, you, you look at the fields around London in the 15th century, there are a lot of them, and Bristol the same. Um, and again, pretty well every village, every town would have had that um, happening. Um, not many people actually know what a tenterhook is nowadays, I don't think. We all know we're on tenterhooks, but you can see the analogy that if it's stretched, you're under tension, um, and, and people under tension are on tenterhooks. Bit of a diversion, but I, I enjoy it. Um, Richard the Lionheart. Probably the English king, one of the worst English kings there's ever been, on the basis he never spent much time here and bled the country dry for money. But he gets a statue outside the Houses of Parliament. 
Um, if only the the leftists would knock that one down, I would be grateful. But there you go. But PR works, I tell you, PR works. Anyway, you probably know from history that in 1193, on the way back from his crusade in the Holy Land, he was shipwrecked near and captured and held for ransom near Vienna. Huge ransom for the time. You know, a king was worth lots of uh, money. The ransom for Richard the Lionheart was largely paid not by the people you think might have paid it, the nobility, but it was largely paid by the crown seizing the clippings, the wool clippings from the big monastic orders for that year and the following year. Um, and that was worth pretty well enough to pay this huge ransom for the king. And again, I bring that forward just as an illustration, just how valuable, just how much money was involved in the world trade at this time. It's, it's so hard to comprehend the dominance of it, um, you're in, living as we do, where there's all sorts of industries. Um, that was really quite important. Again, just a quickie. Um, Mentioned in Magna Carta, 1215, um, the wool trade and the way it was governed was mentioned in that. And again, treat that as a second illustration of the importance of the wool trade. Please don't ask me what a haberjex was. I have the foggiest notion, but it's a nice word, isn't it? So again, very important. And I'm afraid I'm going to bore you with a few dates now, um, just to give you some context. Um, I told you earlier that sort of fulling mills were set up um, mainly in the 13th century, but the first one, uh, certainly in our part of the world, was 1185 um, in Temple Guiting up in Gloucestershire and spread from there. 1218, they laid down the laws governing um, weavers and fullers. Benjamin Magna Carta we talked about. Um, in 1219, there was a fulling mill set up near Taunton. So again, spreading very quickly into Somerset. 1275, the first export tax in English history was imposed on wool. And that is a crucial date that you don't find in many of the history books because it went on um, to become a crucial tax for English governance. At one stage, something like 90% of the export taxes that were raised came from the wool trade. 90%. Um, and of course, over time, it started off, as these taxes always do, nice and low. And gradually, of course, it got increased and increased and increased. Um, you know, the goose that uh, laid the golden egg. And to help raise the taxes, to help um, get the money in, they, in 1326, established that you had to export your wool through the staple towns, they were called. And I've got them listed there. And the idea behind that was that it made it much easier to get the taxes paid. That if it had to go through half a dozen places, you had um, all the uh, instruments of government there to gather the taxes together. And of course, if you look at the list, the one that's important for us is Exeter. That the wool from this part of the world was focused down, basically down the A38. Um, to Exeter, um, and Exeter grew very rich on the export of wool. And finally, on that list is 1348, um, when the Black Death occurred. One Just backtracking a stage, um, it came customary for the king to be allocated, to be granted, the excise juices on um, on the wool exports. 
the taxes. Um, and that was his main source or her main source of income for centuries. Um, and of course, it enabled the throne at times to be quite independent. It also paid for war, for armies. So if you read about the Battle of Agincourt in Cressy and the French Wars, those armies weren't cheap. And those armies were largely paid for by the taxes on the wool industry. Again, just an illustration as to how the commerce of the time influenced the politics. But um, another indication of the importance of wool, and again, it's, uh, you probably know this anyway, but the Lord Chancellor in the House of Lords sits on the wool sack. Now, back in the day, the Lord Chancellor was second only to the king in terms of his importance. He was the second most important person in the land. And to remind him every day, fire his bottom, of the importance of the wool trade, um, they instituted this, that he sat on the, the so-called wool sack, which is quite a large, what do we call it, really, a sofa, isn't it, with the back? Um, but um, even today, the um, modern equivalent of the Lord Chancellor sits on the wall sack. And just to give you, again, a bit more indication, um, I don't know the numbers mean much, but I'll, I'll quote them anyway, that at peak, England was exporting 40,000 um, uh, sacks, sacks is the word, of wool and each sack weighed 26 stone 364 pounds now quite why they chose 26 stone i do not know um obviously 364 pounds is a lot more than one man could lift um i'm not sure maybe it was what a pack animal could carry i don't know why they chose that there must be a reason um and it varied over over time but for politics and so on but a lot of wool being exported. That's just a typical ship of the time that might have been used to export the wool. Um, on the right, there's um, I just threw in picture a picture of the the Newport ship. You know the remains of the ship that was found in Newport um, around about 1450. Again, a merchant ship of the time. I said Exeter was important, and it really was. And if you go to Exeter today, you can still go to the um, the quite magnificent hall of the Weavers, Fullers and um, Shearsmen a Guild. Um, that is still there and they still run a charitable foundation. And if you look at their crest on the um, left, there's a loom. There are the shuttles. There are the shears. And there's a the teasel. So again, the instruments of the trade very much illustrated on their crest. The main export, as I have said, was white broadcloth. White, it wasn't yet dyed. Broadcloth, it wasn't yet shrunk. Um, so that's what it was about. But it's worthwhile just pointing out that we're talking about quite a long process here, uh, going abroad, moving around the country. And as a result of the wool trade, a lot of ancillary activities took place, particularly the development of banking. There was a lot of credit involved. Um, and so it had ramifications way beyond the actual industry. Again, keeping control of it, all the wool had to be exported to Calais. And several times a year, there were big wool fairs held in Calais where the buyers from all over the continent came to Calais to sample the wares and buy their wool. Um, and as you, I'm sure you were all taught at school that Mary Tudor um, said when she lost Calais to the French, that um, when she died, you would find Calais written on her heart. And it was of crucial importance again to the wool trade um, that the, they had to find new ways of getting their wool to market. And the key market 
was Flanders, basically modern day Belgium. So again, those of you who've had holidays in that part of the world will know how wonderfully um, ornate and well-built many of the merchant houses are in some of those cities mentioned there. Wool, wool money, money from the wool trade, every last one of them. Um, that was the upside. The downside was that Flanders, um, as you can quite happily spot, it's right next to France. And so when we indulged in our national hobby of going to war with France, Flanders was in a rather awkward situation because they were natural allies of France. But when they had their wool supplies cut off, then there was abject poverty, starvation, people out of work in Flanders. So for a couple of centuries, they were walking a tightrope between keeping us happy and keeping the French happy. The other main market for um, broadcloth was Florence and North Italy. And again, I think you can make the connection very quickly that the, the Medici's and the whole banking system which developed in North Italy, a lot of it was to do with credit. Um, the credit was needed to import the wool that they then finished off in their, um, their, their, their looms there. I briefly mentioned the back Black Death. A watershed in so many respects in English history. The key one I want to concentrate on here, though, was I've previously mentioned how concentrated land ownership was. Well, after the Black Death, after a third to a half of the population had probably died in Somerset and places like here, then the big landowners had to break up their estates um, to get them worked. That You couldn't get the workers to work on the big estates. And so you had smaller producers. Um, you had the rise of much more in the way of middlemen, woolmen they were called, who collected the wool from the farmers to sell it on to the merchants in the staple towns. Um, and um, you know, the wool to trade very much became the, the, the um, province of smaller traders. Um, even in 1353, just after the Black Death, um, the wool trade was described as the sovereign merchandise and jewel of the realm. So, you know, pretty important stuff. I think you probably recognise perhaps the, um, the, the the pile of hurdles on the right. That's from Pretty. Pretty Fair, Pretty Sheep Fair, um, was first established in 1348 when the market in Wells had to close down because of the Black Death. So it was running, I know it stopped now, but it was run until very recently, until then, as a sheep fair. Um, and... Um, on the left, there's a contemporary picture of sheep in hurdles, pretty well exactly the same as you can see um, that were used in Pretty. As I said, the sheep were allowed to graze pretty well ad lib. Um, the shepherds did look after them, um, but they were much more free range than we are used to. And Nobody really knows, as I say, what they look like, what sort of varieties we were talking about. Um, but you can imagine them over the over the Mendips, um, you know, being gathered together, um, particularly for the winter. The wool, um, the quality of it depends on a number of factors um, listed there, so I won't go through them. Um, but broadly speaking, the more wool you get off a sheep, probably in those days, the lesser the quality. Um, I'll just explain that crimp, um, as the name probably implies, is the natural waviness within a, in the wool, in the wool fibre, and it gives it a sponginess uh, in, in the texture. So that's what the buyers were looking at. So if you got all those bits right, you've got a high price for your wool. If you didn't, um, you, you didn't. 
as I said, sheep were found throughout Somerset. Um, Somerset wool was reckoned to be the best in the West Country. Um, it was of middling quality. The best wool came from Lincolnshire and Yorkshire up north. But the best wool came from Weathers, which are castrated rams. Um, they gave the best quality fleece. You obviously needed to keep your ewes alive to replenish the flock. But whereas nowadays it's almost normal for ewes to produce twin lambs, back in the day, probably only about 3.3 um, of a, a lamb per ewe. So it took three ewes to produce one viable um, lamb each, each, each season. They died, they were barren, whatever. Um, older sheep produced the better quality fleece until they um, went off. Um, a shepherd was able to look after something like 300 sheep. That was the normal flock. Um, and they reckoned on grazing six sheep or so to an acre. Largely, as I say, it was free range, but in the winter, um, they did bring them down off the hill quite often into, sorry, um, into cover, particularly for the pregnant ewes. They obviously needed the better grazing and the, and the more protection. Like I said earlier, it's a changing industry. And I think this slide is really quite revealing that if you go back to the mid 14th century, Pretty well, all of the wool was exported as wool rather than as cloth. By the time you get through to 1614, James I actually banned the export of wool, that it was decided that it was needed for the domestic industry and shouldn't be exported. So over one and a half, two centuries, the whole industry changed out of all recognition. Um, like I implied, they did try to keep as many animals alive through the winter. Um, they didn't have modern fodder uh, crops. Um, but I would again emphasize that the, the value was in the wool, not the meat. So a barren ewe would probably get chopped chopped up fairly quickly because her wool wouldn't be as valuable as the castrated males and if she wasn't going to produce um, any lambs then um, tough. In terms of medieval wool garments they produced pretty well anything out of wool because they weren't the alternatives that um, we know of today. Um, what uh, The problem is of course that what is illustrated is usually the stuff that the aristocracy wore rather than the man in the street. Um, but a whole variety of garments produced from wool, um, garments that we wouldn't necessarily expect to be wool today. So how did the wool get from Mendip to Bruges? Just to recap, really. So the shearer would shear the sheep, tie the fleece up in a bundle. A wool sorter would come along uh, open the bundle and sort the wool into the various grades. So you'd have a bundle of the top grade from 20 sheep, let's say, and then another bundle of the very short fibres. A wool man, a middleman, would take wool of a particular quality down to the staple, in our case, Exeter, um, by pack animal usually in this part of the world. It was then taken to the staple town, weighed for the tax to be paid on it. The stapler would then ship the wool to their representative in Calais uh, when it was there. And then the buyers from Europe would come and pick it up. Um, as I implied, there was a lot of forward buying that you know, people um, contracted to take a whole flock's worth of, of wool a year ahead, let's say. And when the merchants sent their wool to Calais, it was obviously fairly dangerous down the channel. So they would usually split their um, produce between several ships. 
I think I've already emphasised that the governments of the day, first of all, saw the wool industry as a cash cow. <coughs> um, but secondly, wanted to um, keep, keep the wool industry going because of the employment it provided. One way they did that was the sumptuary law. There have been several of them over time, but the one of 1571 in the reign of Elizabeth I laid down that the lower orders had to have a woolen cap and they had to wear it on Sunday on any festival day. And again, it was intended entirely to support the wool industry, make the, the, the poor people pay for it. Um, of course, the rich got away, wore their silk and whatever else, but the poor had to uh, had to wear the wool. Um, and I suspect most of the poor people didn't wear caps as nice as that one either. <laughs> um, again, off a bit of a tangent, but I found it quite interesting. There's on record um, an entry for a chap by the name of John Irish who lived in Yatton in 1578. Um, and I'll, I'll let you read it, but basically it's evident from what was written that he was covering many aspects of the wool trade, um, except for dyeing. And he then um, arranged to have a dyeing house built so that he'd got the whole thing covered, which was quite unusual for the time. He was quite early doing vertical integration, as we would term it today. The trouble is there's very little written record from that time, so one is very dependent on a very limited number of um, of, of documents, uh, and you get one like that, and it shows a real light on at least one individual locally. The wool industry, inevitably, as all industries do, started to face competition, and the key aspect was that suddenly you had merino wool coming in from Spain, which was of much higher quality than most of the British wool. Um, now, as I've already indicated, by this stage, certainly a lot of the trade was actually with finished cloth rather than um, you know, wool exports on its own. And um, so increasingly over decades, over centuries, the English mills depended more and more on Spanish, particularly Spanish, imports. Um, Spain predictably tried to prevent the export of um, merino sheep. Um, eventually, they, they they did get into France and so on. Um, but it was one of the aspects that led to the decline of sheep growing in this country. One of the other ones was, of course, just the demand for land. As the population grew, more food was needed. Um, land became more desirable, more expensive for other purposes. Um, very much depended on prices at the time. Uh, another throwback to the past is, it still exists actually, is there's the remains of an old mill building at Avoncliff uh, down the other side of Bath um, that was originally built in 1590, that the, the weir is still there. Um, an indicative that the industry, again, is starting to concentrate um, on major major sites. Um, another indication of what was happening locally is a snapshot of 1727 when they decided to govern the production of medleys um, more uh, tightly. Now, medley is where you've got um, threads of different colours twisted together um, before it goes through the loom. Um, and an example of the cloth that it produces there on the right. And as you can see, those are the areas in the eastern part of Somerset um, that were designated as being the most important for wool production at that time. So again, very locally, you've got the harp trees. Um, it, Bath obviously was important. Shepton Mallet was a big, big town uh, and the Chew area. Um, again, with so much actually of Somerset history, you almost wonder why the county exists insofar as 
that part of the eastern part of the county, northeastern part of the county, so often follows the trends of Wiltshire, whereas the southern area often has a different, um, different aspect to it. In terms of concentration, as so often happens, the middlemen were the men making the real money out of the trade. So what you were getting were a lot of weavers everywhere across Somerset. Pretty well every village, every hamlet would have somebody or many people weaving um, a family business. They would um, have their wives, have their children um, working for them. And it was the wool merchants who bought their wool from them at as low a price as they could um, give and who then had it processed, had it exported and so on. And that is just one example. That is a house in Shepton Mallet, on the outskirts of Shepton Mallet, that was built in the 1700s for a local wool merchant. Um, not a bad, not a bad pad for somebody in trade in the time. Um, as I said, that the decline of the locally produced wool happened over centuries, actually. But part of it was that sheep started to be prized much more for mutton than for the wool they produced. And in late Georgian times, we got the situation where people for the first time ever really were breeding sheep for specific trays for certain aspects of their character. Um, that is a fairly common sort of painting. I mean, oh, sorry, a uh, fairly sort of common painting. Um, that you had the lords of the manor, didn't you? Sort of really proud of their prize horse or their proud of sheep and got the local artist to um, have a painting of it. Um, so I can guarantee to you that a sheep that fat ain't going to be producing very good wool. Um, but again, it's just indicative of the emphasis heading towards mutton rather than the wool. And of course, um, this is the period where the development of most of the um, different breeds that we know today started. Um, and that's just some examples of sheep breeds that are extant today, most of which originated back around about that sort of same time uh, and developed. Equally, you had uh, more textiles developing in competition uh, to wool, particularly cotton coming from India initially, um, and linen which largely came from France initially. So suddenly um, you're finding that whereas wool had been the absolute staple of, of textiles in this country for centuries, suddenly there were other materials um, which were more comfortable to wear very often. Um, and if you were status conscious, had higher status. Another, yet another attempt to try and boost the wool industry. In 1667, they laid down an act that you had to be buried in a woolen shroud. By act of parliament, unless you were a pauper or unless you died of the plague, you had to be buried in a woolen shroud. And if you look in the, um, the burial registers in Blagden Church, for example, um, many of the entries for this period have got written against it that they were buried in a woolen shroud um, just in case the inspectors came round to, to check up on you. Um, another way of boosting the demand for wool. I mean, the penalty for non-compliance was five pounds, which when the average wage was probably something like seven shillings, six shillings, seven shillings a week, was, um, you know, it's real money. The real um, start of the end for the domestic industry was mechanisation. As I've said, imagine this whole area, all of Somerset, all of England. Everywhere you went, there would be weavers with their children, their wives spinning the, the, the thread for them to then weave. The wool merchant coming around once a week, once a fortnight to collect what they've woven. 
um, moaning because he would always reckon that they'd pinched some of the thread and were selling it on the side. A lot of um, problems that way. But they reckon that there were 10 people spinning were needed to supply one weaver. Um, that productivity in the weaving had increased faster than in the spinning. Um, and so when in 1764, the spinning jenny started, where suddenly you got um, a whole number of spindles there um, coming through, as you're turning the wheel by hand um, to into a thread. So you've got the threads coming through here um, and actually working far more effectively, much more efficiently than a spinning wheel. That was just the start. It developed, as you would expect. Um, I mean, this is a, 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 a Cartwright loom. Um, you've got the sp you're spinning, sorry, it's not, it's, um, it is, sorry, it is, it is. You've got a spinning mule, which was developed for what you've just seen. And of course, you've got steam engines developing. And as soon as you've got steam engines developing to run these machines, then the times for the West Country and Somerset were numbered because the industry by and large moved up north where the coal was cheaper. A lot of exceptions. Um, there were uh, textile mills in the Somerset until very recently, actually. Um, I mean, this is one of this is the Fox Mill near Wellington, and Wellington was a major, major textile center. Um, huge building, now derelict. I don't know if it's been developed now, but certainly derelict at the time of that picture. Um, so it lasted through quite some while. I mean, a key tipping point was actually the Napoleonic Wars, that there was a lot of demand for um, fairly poor quality stuff for uh, uniforms. And as soon as the Napoleonic Wars ended, then... Um, then demand collapsed and a lot of the, the local people went out of business. Um, just to give you a few more dates to remember, um, Taunton, as an example, I mean, I could have chosen Shepton Mallards, I could have chosen Wellington, I could have chosen a number of places. But Taunton, um, I've already mentioned that it had one of the first falling mills in the, the south of the country, southwest of the country. It was fairly soon importing wool from Wales and Ireland because the local flock weren't able to keep up their demand. Um, the quality declining. Um, but in 1635, when Charles I raised ship money as a tax, Taunton was the highest in the county the most valuable place in Somerset um, on the basis of the wool industry there. And the numbers are hardly credible in 1680 odd. They reckon there were 3000 men working and that's just the men. Women didn't count, I'm afraid. Um, as combers and weavers in a population that was probably 10, 12,000 people. So, if the number is anything like accurate, you can pretty well say everybody pretty well in Taunton who was in a trade was in the wool trade. And uh, again, I'm sure you'll do all of those of you who remember my wonderful talk on the Monmouth Rebellion. Um, I won't ask hands up because I might be disappointed by the answer. But those of you who do will remember that a lot of the rebels in 1685 were textile workers from Taunton and the area who joined the Monmouth Rebellion. Uh, but they were independent men. They didn't want a, a, a Catholic uh, a crown. Um, but all things come to an end. In 1706, it was reported that there was a real slump in the, the industry and many of the men were having to join the army um, to get fed. And I mean, joining the army wasn't something you did lightly in those days, I do assure you. Back again in 1720, trade lifting, and um, they were taking on a lot of apprentices, which again is a good sign that trade was booming. Um, but again, 1730s decline. Um, and 
other industries really started to take over in Taunton towards the end of that, um, that century. Getting towards the end, just two aspects I'd like to um, pick up on. I mean, the Victorian period, there were there was a textile industry, an important textile industry in Somerset. It was being eclipsed by Yorkshire in particular, but there were textile mills here and many of them survived through to the Second World War and even beyond. But I haven't really put much emphasis on them because by then it was just one industry amongst many, whereas up until, shall we say, the 1700s, wool was it. Um, after then, yes, it was there, um, but um, it was one of many. I've already talked briefly about Fuller's Earth, which was an important product locally at one point. They, it's a bit like cat litter. Cat litter is actually very similar to Fuller's Earth. Very absorbent uh, is the key aspect to it. Um, Clay-like substance. And I've listed there some of the main mines where they actually dug up Fuller's Earth that was used in the textile industry, um, as I say, to clean the cloth to absorb the impurities and the lanolin in it and it was shipped not just around somerset but across up into the north and so on and yeah. you get fuller's earth even today there's soap containing fuller's earth that's an american brand in fact but uh, um, it's still mined quite extensively in america it's not mined anywhere at all in this country now Teasels, I've already mentioned. Um, I've shown you the crest down in Exeter. This is the much posher crest um, for the London um, Guild of Cloth Workers, which was one of the oldest guilds in London. I think it's about the 13th oldest or something. But again, very much like the Exeter one. Um, I mean, I love this because, I mean, who in their right minds thought of putting a sheep on top of, top of a knight's helmet on a crest. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, a lion may be, a unicorn I can just about take, but a sheep, there you go. Um, and, but further down, you've again got the shuttles, or the loom, and the inevitable teasel, um, which uh, um, I think just again shows the importance of it. Um, I showed you earlier on um, the uh teasel handle the wooden thing that is a teasel frame now i said to you that they were used right into the 20th century that was the sort of kit that they were used on so very much mechanized still mounting teasels but by the hundred um and so the cloth rotated under the teasels in one direction the teasels rotated in the other direction um but again the principle was exactly the same that if anything went wrong, if there was a flaw in the cloth, it was the teasel that broke rather than the cloth. But because it was mechanised that way, the demand for teasels, again, lasted much later than you might have expected, that there wasn't a good mechanical substitute for them um, until quite late on. So, in fact, teasel production peaked probably in around about 1850-odd. And teasels were grown extensively in this local area. Um, they're the, the the main places around here where teasels were grown. Um, it was a bit of a pig of a crop, actually. Um, it took two years to fully develop. And over that time, if it was too wet, then you could lose the whole lot. It was a risky crop from that point of view. But if conditions were right... A very valuable one. It was ghastly, apparently, to cut. You had to cut the heads um, for obvious reasons. It was all you had all these sort of um, hooks that would get onto your skin. The slightest scratch and the teasel sap apparently was very painful. So, in the height of summer, when you actually cut them, you had men, and it was always men doing the job usually, um, having to wear heavy horse hair, um, horse hide coats to protect themselves with thick gloves um, in the heat of the summer. Um, 
so it wasn't a, and it was quite a skillful job. You had to have a definite upward stroke to to get them off cleanly. So uh, it wasn't a, a good crop from that point of view. And yet again, dare I say it, it was the merchants that probably made the money. Um, I mean, it's recorded that in Blagden, um, one merchant made his fortune by buying teasels at a pound a sack and hanging on to them until there was a shortage and selling them at five pounds a sack. Um, nice money if you can get it. And there's records of a number of houses in Blagden, around Bell Square, for example, um, that were owned by teasel dealers. Um, yes, um, as I think I said, teasels, you had to use them wet. It was a, whole, a wet process. And so after they'd been used, they had to be dried out. <laughs> And that's a rare surviving teasel drying house. Uh, you see the way the air allowed to flow through it. Um, there is on record men from this area taking teasels by horse and cart up to Yorkshire which I, I just cannot understand, but I mean, it's fairly well documented. Um, it would take you about a month with a horse and cart. Um, and, you, you know, why wouldn't you send it by canal or railway? But uh, um, I imagine if you're the young lad and it's the autumn and there's nothing much to do on the farm and you persuade dad to let you take the, the horse and the cart off to have a jolly up to Yorkshire, it's quite an adventure, I suspect, in the time. Um, but uh, the, a lot of the demand was in, in Yorkshire, <laughs> where well, they grew their own as well. But um, the great advantage of the Somerset the teasels was ours cropped that much earlier because of the climate. Uh, and so they were available before the, um, the, 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 uh, the homegrown Yorkshire ones. Um, so interesting from that point of view, equally socially, as I said, cutting teasels was quite a skilled occupation and not for everybody. And so there's quite a lot of evidence that people moved, when they cut on their own farm, they moved around cutting on other farms as well. And um, as I showed on the last slide, there were quite a lot of teasels grown up down on the levels as well. And so there's quite a lot of evidence of men from Blagden and the environs around here going down to the levels to help with their harvest uh, and at least sometimes ending up marrying you know, the sisters of the blokes down there uh, and sometimes moving back here, sometimes um, staying down there. So that's the a, a sort of very, very quick canter through the wool industry. I hope I've emphasised just how important it was, uh, but it's interesting who ultimately benefited from it. The Crown, clearly, that they had money to fight their foreign wars. They had money to be independent of Parliament for longer than they should have been. The large landowners, inevitably, particularly in the days of the monasteries, um, when you've got people like Fountains Abbey with sheep, a flock of 12,500 sheep. Um, it just doesn't bear thinking about, does it? How, many, how much land you'd need to run 12,500 sheep. The church... I mean, a lot of money went to the church in terms of things like the Blagden cow that we started off with. And I think I've emphasised that throughout this area, if you go to places like Shepton Mallet, Wellington, Taunton, um, the really nice old houses, very often the chances are that it was a wool merchant or trader that ultimately had them originally built. The people who didn't do so well were the, as always, perhaps the small guy, the, the, the smaller farmers, the, the, the shepherds who were out long hours in all weathers. But I think the people I've got the most sympathy for are actually the, the weavers who for a couple of centuries, as I say, it was very much a cottage industry. There wasn't any advantage about bringing them all together because they weren't using mechanical machinery or anything. It was all... Um, hand and done. 
and were basically exploited by everybody further up the chain that they worked long hours um, for essentially subsistence wages that they had to employ their family um, to make ends meet and um, you know generally um, had the freedom from being their own bosses but um, not really um, so a lot of the houses in places like Blagdon would have had, as I said, a little shed attached with the loom in um, and long hours, particularly in the long hours of summer daylight, um, working there whilst your daughter was back in the house spinning away to keep you uh, keep you in, um, in, in raw materials. Um, I have to say, I mean, this is a slightly early version of the, the nursery rhyme. Um, there are several places round about with sheep in the place name. Shipham, for example, is Sheepham. Shepton Mallet, again, it's sheep at the start of the name. Um, but one thing I find rather, I have to say, I do take pleasure in is going down church path of a morning and uh, seeing sheep grazing in the field below the church as they were probably a thousand years ago um different sheep different field but uh, they're still there thank you thank you very much Ken, for um, your erudition. um i thought we were, we were all held on tenterhooks there when I um, was <laughs> struggling with the technology. You and me both. Don't even go there. <laughs> Is there any questions? <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, that's that one. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. Yes. Almost certainly, yes. I mean, Fuller is also a fair indication of Fulling having taken place there. So I... Well, that's a good point. Yes. I will investigate. I mean, Fuller... Fuller in their name, a place name is almost indicative, is bound to be tied up somehow with the process, but I don't know that one in particular. Good point, very interesting point. Thank you. Was there a time before we, I, I went to a, a mill in Kent a couple of years back, mm -hmm. and it was, it had been a, a mill for making felt. Yes. It was like a sort of Standard clock at the time, I was told. And certainly, it was well, it was well, well regarded by certain countries in Europe. Yes. Yes. And it's just created by hammering wool, by tightening the. Yeah, that's the right. That's exactly that process. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, felt um, is was one particular grade of wool, as you rightly imply, very thick, very much hammered. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, in, in a way you could make whatever grade you wanted within limits by how long you left the wall to go through the process. Um, clearly the longer you left it, the less material you got out in terms of square meterage. Um, and therefore you had the trade-off between quality thickness and quantity. Um, and as I think I've applied, a lot of the mills, if you actually dig into their history, um, were used for all sorts of different things. Um, and, you know, one one tenant might use a water mill for cloth making. Um, the next one might again convert it to button making or milling corn or another process that it was just what you put on the end of the uh, the shaft. But yes, no, you're absolutely right. That felt was quite important. Another thing that 
Oh, and it used low quality wool, of course. Could use clothes. Yeah, but there's different grades of uh, these uh, different qualities of the Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, the tender hooks as well. I I understood tender hooks to be the things that held the um, were used in a bed um, where you had a a sort of piece of, piece of cloth held tight. Yes. With a cord. Um, that was held on tenter hooks, and you, you would tighten them before you went to bed, so you slept tight. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah that's the that's bed. But it's just a probably like we regard nails today. You know, they're just a multi-purpose. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know that use, but yeah, quite potentially. Certainly, in in the textile industry, they were mounted on those frames, and um, as I implied, the the cloth would go on it wet, and as it dried out, it would shrink and tighten, and hence the the tension on on tenter hooks. This is what you do now with spinning, and then you wash the yeah. You got that, and then you you suspend it um, on dowels, wooden dowels, mm -hmm. again, and you put quite a bit of weight on the like this. Yeah, I'll put the weight on the bottom. Right. Yes. And that's that's it. Yeah. 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 <coughs> there's an old, there's an old mill, Otterburn, which you come down the A. One. It may be A1 by then, on the way down through Jedburgh, mm. if you come on down. Yeah, and then there's at the back of the mill there, they produce a lot of cloth, which is used by the royal family and things like right. that. But around the back of that place, there is a huge frame. Yes. Which is oh, right. Oh, interesting. Cloth. Interesting. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, I hope it's not bad taste to mention Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in, the, in the hills around the... Uh, Major cities in West Yorkshire, yeah. And so on. The, the cottages on the hill, which are 15th, 17th century, it's a big domestic weaving industry. Yes. Now, those cottages are not notable because of an architectural feature. They've got the windows. Very big windows. Yes. But presumably that was pre industrialization because uh, it's still a domestic weaving industry. But you don't see it down here. You don't no, you're absolutely right. I mean, in, in Yorkshire and in many parts of the country, the domestic weaving weavers actually were able to keep going surprisingly long period of time because weaving wasn't um, industrialised early on. It was the some of the other processes that the spinning and so on first. Um, the same thought across my mind, there is no evidence or much evidence of those sort of properties in Somerset. Um, I can only think that the, the wool industry up there was at that stage more affluent that they could afford. Whereas the, the evidence here is very much that the weavers put wooden, had wooden lean-tos to their cottages, that sort of very crude, cheap architecture. Um, some of them particularly where they backed on to common land or church land, would very often um, encroach on it and um, do it that way. But you're right. I mean, to my knowledge, there is no real tradition of that down this part of the world. Um, yeah, it would be more interesting to know why, actually. But I suspect it's to do with affluence. The, um, the prep, I don't know. Yes, yes. Um, it's surprising, actually, how little written evidence there is of the textile industry. I mean, you, you know, you get, you, you get the history of Acts of Parliament and the great the doings of the great and the good. But when it comes to uh, base commerce, you know, people throw away their receipts and uh, you know, the contracts. Sorry? No, no. Oh, OK. Yeah, yes, he did. Was he that much later? Um, no, I have to say, I mean, you were saying about weights. One of, one of the things that um, first got me interested in archaeology was in Lincoln. Um, I remember going to one of the um, archaeological digs and they found um, a series of Roman weights 
for the for, on a loop for a loom um to keep the tension of the various threads exactly the same um and i mean that caught my imagination you know that it was uh you know obviously important to might even have been mendip lead for all i know but uh, um it was uh you know clearly the romans were using exactly the same sort of looms as uh, we were until um quite late yes I just looked up how to check. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a 9 o'clock made in very early times, but it's cheaply one by month. Oh, right. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, I do hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, probably the. The, 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 the basic monks would have the hairy stuff. The abbot might not. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Ah, that's my voice held out, which is what I was worried about. Oh.